Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. So my name is Yannick Rosal from the St. Lawrence River Institute and we are excited to bring you this panel's discussion tonight on anglers and scientists. So this event is being co-hosted by Bluefish Canada, the Canadian Fishing Network and the Great River Report. And it is being streamed on the Bluefish Canada YouTube channel, the St. Lawrence River Institute's Facebook page and the Canadian Fishing Network's Facebook page. As this is a virtual event, we have audience members and panelists joining us from various locations. And I myself am coming to you today from the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee. We have an incredible lineup of panelists today who are experts in tournament organization and fishery research from across Canada. So the second half of this one hour panelist discussion will include a question and answer period from the audience in which you can direct your questions to the panelists. Tonight, we're also joined by Lawrence Gunther, who is who will be hosting tonight's event, and a little bit about Lawrence before I pass it on over to him. So Lawrence is the founder of Bluefish Canada, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the health and future of Canada's water and wild fish stocks. Lawrence is the host of Bluefish Radio podcast, as well as Outdoors with Lawrence Gunther podcast. He is a renowned angler, writer for Outdoors Canada magazine, a motivational speaker, and filmmaker, amongst many, many other titles. So without further ado, here is Lawrence Gunther, your host for the evening. Hey, thanks, Yannick. Uh, it's so great to be uh, part of this um, great Wednesday night science presentations to anglers, to outdoor conservationists, to people who just care about what's going on out there. And I think we've got a super exciting topic today. It's a topic that really touches on some very important things. How do you get the biologists, the data they need to do their work? I mean, you can't, if to get a scientist out there and catching the fish themselves, that's a lot of time and effort and a lot of a lot of time and effort, you know, you, you can't just get a bunch of researchers out there fishing for days upon days to gather that data, going out to tournaments, tagging fish and examining fish, you know, that are about to be released. That's one solution. But through these apps, like the angler app, you know, that um, my catch that, that the angler Atlas has produced, that's going to make some really big differences. And we're going to hear from some scientists across Canada that are using this already to collect data, the data, the most precious data they can do ever find when it comes to fisheries research. We're going to hear from some angling organizers, some tournament organizers on how they're using this app to host virtual tournaments, right? Like the days of COVID having a whole bunch of people together at a dock, you know, in a lot of places, it's not even legal when they have shut down. So it's, it's put a real crimp into tournament fishing, but this app has made this sort of virtual tournament uh, opportunity a reality. And it's, so it's doing two things, right? It's, it, it's being used to organize fishing tournaments and, and to collect data at the same time for biologists. So we've got some great people lined up. They're going to answer your questions at the end, but let's give each of them five minutes to talk about why they think this is such a great idea. You heard my opinion. Let's let's start with Sean Simmons from um, from Anglers Atlas. What, Yannick, introduce Sean. Yeah, so Sean Simmons is our first panelist tonight, and he is the founder of the MyCatch app and Anglers Atlas. Well, thank you, Yannick, and, uh, and thank you, Lawrence. Uh, can you hear me all right? Am I coming through? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'll do is uh, I got five minutes. So just want to sort of set the stage for how we got to this point. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with just a little bit of background on me. I'm a, actually what's called a limnologist. Uh, for those not familiar with the term, it's the study of lakes. And I'm based here in Prince George, British Columbia. If you can see the map behind me, about nine hours north of Vancouver, centered in 360 degrees of amazing wilderness up here in northern BC. And uh, I studied a lake that went through a big fish kill in 93. And when I was doing my research, I realized all this great data had been collected historically, detailed maps, stocking information, all this fabulous information that if you have a fish is gold mine. So I, after I graduated, I started publishing the Angler's Atlas, which is essentially just free fishing maps for anglers. We started with about 15 around Prince George. And over the last 20 some years, we've grown that to over a quarter million water bodies across Canada into the Northern United States. And the anglers, uh, I mean, the free maps are really the core draw, but one thing we've learned is that uh, they also like to contribute data back to us. So uh, we've been collecting data from anglers for years, mostly photographs, and they'll do map markers and species contributions. And so we built up quite an interesting database. And then the key year for us when my catch was born was 2017. And that's when we were presenting some of our findings, at the World Recreational Fisheries Conference. And I got 
to meet a whole bunch of fisheries researchers down in Victoria. And uh, one thing really occurred to me, and anyone that can see the map behind me, there's easily a million fish bearing waters across that map, probably closer to 10 million. And we know almost nothing on the vast majority of those uh, uh, waters, simply because it's so expensive to do traditional creel surveys, netting surveys, uh, even the traditional mail-in surveys. So the idea is if we've got about a million anglers visiting our site each year, we know some of them are passionate conservationists and really want to help and contribute back. So after that conference, we launched the MyCatch app, and you can also use our website for it as well, just to see, can we get some basic creel data? We want to see, can we get data that can be matched with creel survey? That was really our, our first corporate uh, goal. And by the end of 2018, we had collect data on thousands of lakes and rivers across Canada and realized that there's a real opportunity here to leverage the anglers many, as I mentioned, passionate conservationists to start answering key questions. We know the fisheries biologists are limited because they simply don't have budgets to go out and survey using conventional techniques. So that was really sort of the origin. Now, what happened is COVID allowed us to supercharge it. So we used to do these things called magazines. Uh, COVID killed that part of the business, but it opened up a whole new area for us because uh, two of our, our staff are tournament anglers, and they saw across the country all these tournaments closing. We thought, well, we've got a reporting tool for the app why don't we convert that into a tournament catch photo release strong conservation message the idea is you have the fish bring it measure it on a, a, a bump board back in the water in less than a minute so the fish is back swimming so it's a strong conservation message but then the resolution of the data is brilliant we get high resolution photos we get detailed uh, photo, um, uh, length measurements we get date time and locations which we'll talk about a little bit secret spots will stay secret but uh, this allows us to supercharge our data set. So since uh, COVID hit, we've been started work. Well, our first uh, uh, partners that we work with, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, Jeff Wilson and, and Trevor Avery uh, from the East Coast, really was our first pilot where we got to test this idea. And it was a little clunky to start with. But by the end of, uh, I think it was May 2020, uh, we launched it June. We started firing all cylinders and we could see there's a really big opportunity. And so since then, we've just been scaling out tournaments. And from a science perspective, one of the really cool things is we can adjust the dials of the tournament, i.e. the rules, to achieve specific scientific goals. So for example, we just started working with the uh, state of Iowa uh, to get a better sense of how the pressure, angling pressure is across all their stock ponds. So we set up a tournament on all those stock ponds and we can see from the data coming in where most of the pressure is taking place. And that helps them get a better sense of where the most popular uh, ponds are and roughly about the catch rates are. Now, we're very careful about privacy. We will get into this later, but I want to just iterate. Secret spots stay secret, data is anonymized. And uh, we'll get into this. This is a very serious topic. We'll get into this a lot later. But I think that's probably a good stopping point for me. Um, I think I haven't hit my five minute mark. So uh, yeah, I'll zip it and pass it on to the next speaker. Hey, thanks, Sean. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, for sure, we're going to have more questions for you around, you know, how data is kept secret, who gets access to the data, you know, how you manage that. And, uh, you know, in, in today's time, keeping uh, data private and making those security uh, walls strong, it's so important. And I know you're on that. So I think I think people will be relieved to hear the measures you're taking to, to guard that precious data, you know, like where you catch your big fish. No one wants to give that away. Uh, you know, willy nilly, uh, made me a best friend, but only after they do a pinky swear, you know, hey, let's talk to uh, Jeff Wilson. Jeff Wilson uh, is a, I've had him on Bluefish Radio a couple times, and he is a mover and a shaker on the West Coast, man, when it comes to striped bass and muskie and, and, and smallmouth bass. Uh, Yannick, please introduce um, Jeff for us. So Jeff Wilson is our next panelist, and he is a professional angler and the co-founder of the Miramichi Stripper Cup. Let's, uh, let's make sure that's a striper cup, uh, just in case, uh, <laughs> just in case we have some family listening. Yep. Um, yeah, no, listen, uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing me onto the panel. Um, certainly, uh, after getting introduced to, uh, Sean and my catch, uh, was happy to be involved with he and Trevor on the anglers Atlas was the first year we kind of clunked through some of this work and meetings every Monday, Monday to try and uh, get the app working good, which his team did a fantastic job. And then um, last year, uh, when the Striper Cup looked like we were going to have a canceled out year, we were able to uh, gather about $75,000 worth of sponsor money. And, and uh, we went live for a month with uh, Sean's app. 
Um, in the first case, Sean was, he gave us a number to help with his staff. And I had to tell him, geez, I think you're going to be a little shy. I think we ended up with uh, around 800 anglers and uh, they actually weighed in 12,914 fish uh, through the app, which uh, when they did that, that gave enough creel information that none of uh, DFO had. So the striped bass comes into the fresh water. There's no licensing. So we don't know how many fish. We don't know what the statuses are. Very poor information. So this this really gave us a huge opportunity, not only to have the event and do that, but also provide extremely important scientific data to on the striped bass. And uh, that's how originally I started working out with Trevor Avery and the striped bass research team of Yup Next. And, and that all that information, you know, when you go to these DFO meetings, I was lucky enough to be, you know, taken to a Senate committee to testify and do all this for those. They know nothing. But the scientists are excellent and they really want the information. So we kind of looked at ourselves as a bridge between the angler and the scientist through you through Sean's app and really get people excited by giving them some uh, great incentive like fish finders and fishing rods and cash and seemed to really work well. So I didn't even look at the clock, but I know I'm a great chatter. So you just wave your hand at me, Lawrence, if you think I'm taking too long, but uh, yep, that's pretty No, you're good, man. You got a few more minutes. You got but, a few more minutes. Okay. So we, talk, we, yeah. we were, re go ahead there. No, no, talk about some of the family. I mean, you get family and professionals. Yeah, involved. we All had different uh, levels of angling. the it's year amazing. before the Striper Cup had 2,500 participants. Uh, we had uh, people anywhere from uh, five years old to 80 years old. It's a very community driven organization. Um, you know, I just talked to the hotels uh, today, actually, for the Striper Cup in May. They're receiving bookings every day. So I think just a little pent up demand for people to come down here uh, to the Miramichi. And, and we've done some great work. You know, Trevor's team comes up every year and we look forward to that. You know, it's been a real collaboration between the city uh, anglers and the community and the scientists to really uh, pull this off. When you consider DFO, you need a section 52, like this is not easy to get um, DFO licensing to hold two live fish in your live well. People told me I was crazy um, when I decided I'd do this, being a small mouth guy in tournaments forever. They said, you'll never put them in a live well. And we had boats, we had canoes, and some of the drone footage is incredible. Um, for guys that fish smallmouth tournaments, just imagine a shotgun start with 250 boats. And uh, I tried to get them to stop that. And the city said, no way. We get thousands of people on the shore to watch that. We got insurance. Fire the gun. So, okay. It's <laughs> up to you. It is pretty exciting. And we get a lot of people out. So, An amazing fishery. Amazing fishery. And the number of the striped bass. This is a native species, folks. But it's just come back for the third yeah. time. And you know, want to learn more about... Uh, striped bass uh, numbers and what the challenges they've experienced over the over the decades listen to some of the podcasts that jeff and i put together jeff is probably one of the experts but he also is teaming up with really good experts from the university like trevor our next uh, panelist and trevor was the one who was taking all the data off the back end of the my catch app and putting that towards some really good um, purposes and like Jeff mentioned one of those purposes is to educate the politicians on just how important these fisheries are. Um, Yannick, why don't you introduce uh, Trevor? Yep. So our next panelist is Trevor Avery, who is a marine biologist and biostatistician who is an adjunct professor at Acadia University in the Department of Biology. I was more concerned, I guess, about getting my timer started than I was about getting off the uh, mute. So, <laughs> well, you're good. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I think Jeff touched upon a lot of the really good uh, points there. Um, there's a collaboration here. There's a there's there's a couple of bridges. There's there's more than a couple of bridges. There's a bridge between academics and and the community. There's a bridge between academics and developers and and app people like Sean. There's a there's bridges between those two groups. There's all over the place. And that, that final bridge is the, the sort of bridge to get this information back to the uh, policymakers, to, to people that can, can regulate the fishery, but have good information to help regulate that fishery. 
Now, as an academic, uh, I, I, I'm sort of in the middle of that. We don't set regulations. We're really more interested in looking at a problem, looking at an ecosystem, looking at uh, a population of fish and gathering the information that's necessary to answer really cool questions. Where do we get those cool questions from? Almost every cool question I've researched in my entire career has been from a conversation with somebody standing at a riverbank or out in a boat or giving me a phone call and saying, hey, we think we got something here. Can you do something about it? Or can you come look at it? And I'm like, that sounds like a wonderful idea. This is how uh, Jeff and I got hooked up on the Miramichi Striper Cup. I heard about this. I, I took a couple of students. I said, look, you guys are going to go up uh, to this tournament. I said, just go introduce yourself to this guy. I said, I have no idea what's going on with this thing and, uh, and report back. And at that time, everybody wanted to, to take every striped bass out of the Miramichi River. And I thought that's a little bit foolish. They've been there for tens of thousands of years and, you know, they're, they're not going anywhere really. And, uh, uh, they came up and I got this phone call. They said, Hey, you know, everybody up here doesn't like striped bass. I said, well, just, just talk to them. Just don't worry about what the conversation is. Don't try to sell them a message. And we've been going up there. Uh, we went up five, I guess it was five years in a row before it was canceled or four years anyway. And uh, looking real forward to going up there again this year. The types of data we get are, are no different than what you'd normally get when you're catching a fish. That the, the difference is, is that, you know, when it's documented, when it's recorded, we can do something with it. And so that's those simple pieces of information. What is the fish length you caught? That's important. Uh, in the, in the uh, Miramichi Striper Cup, for example, that's all about getting a trophy fish. So, you know, getting the big ones. But we've, we devised when we hooked up with Sean and devised the Atlantic Anglers Challenge, uh, year three next to come up, um, we, we devised that so that we had rules to answer different questions. Things like how many species are out there? And we had one person collect, I think it was 29 different species or something, caught 29 different species of fish. Um, we, we would put rules in to say, you get a prize for the smallest fish. Uh, we'd put weekly prizes on and change the, change the, what we were looking for each week to see if we could target the app to give us information about a specific species or a specific question that we had. Can we use this app and tailor it to fill data gaps? And that's sort of the academic language, the science language, the gap in data. When you fill data gaps, you have more knowledge. When you have that knowledge, you can share it with everybody. And then once that shared knowledge and those conversations start, we start actually answering questions. And those questions are, are important questions to save a lot of the, or could serve a lot of the species that are out there so that, you know, seven generations from now, we can be uh, catching fish the same as we are now. And that's the whole point. Uh, that's why I'm involved. And that's why I think my catch and, and the digitization of the information is the way to go. Trevor, that's fantastic. And, uh, it, you know, how many different species of fish did you log through this process? Do you, do you know offhand? Well, because it's the Atlantic Anglers Challenge, there's, very, there's not that many species of fish out here in the Atlantic, unfortunately. It's not like, <laughs> not like Ontario where you can drop a hook in one lake and pull out uh, 45 different species, right? We only have 36 freshwater yeah. species in Nova Scotia, for example, a few more in New Brunswick. Um, but a, a, along the coast, there's maybe another dozen species that people catch. So we're really talking about 50 species. And I think we, we caught somewhere around 38 or 39 of them wow. over that's, that, over that period. Yeah. That's impressive, my friend. That's impressive. Well, yeah, you know what? almost caught them all. I know. I know. Like the grand slam, the ultimate grand slam, but it, it's obviously impressed our next, uh, uh, guest panelist and, uh, you know, Scotty Martin, um, he's the founder of the Canadian Fishing Network, and yeah, I'm proud to be one of his Monday night regular panelists on, on CFN Live, where we talk about everything fishing from across Canada. And um, he's got 14,000 anglers that follow closely what he's doing, and he's running virtual tournaments across Canada, you know, many times a year and taking this to television. I, I can't say enough of it. Scotty is just a real entrepreneur when it comes to this stuff, and he all does it just off the corner of his desk. 
uh, Yannick, I'll let you introduce Scotty more formally, but um, there you go. You did a good job, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so Scotty Martin is the host of the Canadian Fishing Network and who is also hosting, co-hosting the event with, with Lawrence and myself tonight. So here's Scotty. Well, I'll tell you, it's an honor. And uh, being uh, sort of, um, I want to say the flagship of CFN, uh, I, I'm honored to be here as well as that flagship because I represent so many incredible people. Red Andal was uh, the one, and it's interesting how this has all come to be because Red Andal basically started the Canadian Fishing Network as our founder, as an information gathering platform. Uh, and he did so because he was a new Canadian and really didn't know too much about Canadian angling. His son came to him one day and asked, he said, dad, I want to go fishing. And Red, of course, knew nothing. So he started to look and there wasn't a lot of information out there for, for new Canadian, Canadians. So he built this database uh, which became the initial stages of CFN and brought me in in 2015, 2016 to sort of build the community. And, you know, I'm, I'm socially awkward. So unfortunately, uh, I, I got 14,000 people that just feel sorry for me. And that's why they follow CFN. But we do some incredible stuff. Our community, I, I'm so proud of the fact that we promote angling, uh, both from a, a youth as well as our adult, very, um, you know, conservationist, uh, you know, minded uh, we have great folks like Lawrence and Jason Barnews and Big Jim on every Monday to talk about fishing, to discuss angling uh, from a Canadian perspective, what's going on in Canadian angling, and of course, give a platform for Canadian anglers to be profiled. Uh, Mike Consul came to us and discussed the idea of the CFN fish off. And in its, you know, initial inception, I was very concerned, uh, you know, any kind of term and, and, you know, I tip my hat to, to the Jeff Wilsons of the world who are able to do, you know, a tournament on that large scale. I was very apprehensive, but, you know, Mike talked me through it. And as soon as I heard that it was a multi-species tournament with the emphasis on catch and release, I was in. And we started with six initial anglers in the very beginning and grew it to last year, I think we were close to 600. Uh, we cap it only because our judges can only go through so many submissions at a time. And, and last year was, was definitely our biggest of all years. Uh, so when Mike came to me, and I believe Sean, he uh, spoke to you in regards to setting up uh, the MyCatch app, um, I learned a little bit about what Angler's Atlas was all about and you know discussed it with Lawrence, discussed it with Jay Barnews. And I'm just blown away at what you folks have provided Canadian anglers. And I'm not even sure if a lot of Canadian anglers are aware of it, but because of our multi-species tournament, uh, we wanted to take a little bit of weight and responsibility off our judges. And this My Catch app is exactly, it will it kill so many birds with one stone. And I say that with all due respect to birds. Um, what I've always wanted to do is to bridge the gap between us anglers and of course the biologists, the folks that do the science that learn our fisheries and, and certainly implement actions that are gonna better our fisheries. And I've always said, when it comes to tournaments, we lose that creel sample by not having biologists there. And we only have so many, and of course, you know, weekend tournaments, it's different because they work Monday to Friday. So it's, it's time out of their schedule, their personal time out of their schedule to go to these tournaments. So something like this is exactly what I have been waiting for and hoping for, for a very, very long time. And, you know, lo and behold, WFN and uh, the Sportsman Channel came to us and, and asked if we would like to bring this to TV, what, what we do, because we focus, it's, it's incredible, it's grassroots angling, but the focus is the anger, and as much as people will say I'm the flagship of CFN, I always want the focus to be on the fish, and more so the anglers. What this app does is bridge so many gaps, and I'm so very excited that our Winter Fish Fest that's going to be starting February 1st, where we have designated species is going to be the pilot project that is going to run our uh, the my catch app for the first time on a CFN platform and our anglers are going to get to see how it works firsthand and that alone I'm very very excited but the fact that our multi-species tournament and one of our judges uh, I got to bring up is in Tennessee he's got close to 800 species he's caught personally himself so we're so lucky to have a judge like that that has so much knowledge when it comes to what species are out there and what are available to Canadian anglers. And this my catch uh, is just gonna, it's, it's basically CFN fish off on steroids. And uh, I can't wait to introduce it to our anglers in the Winter Fish Fest. As I said, it's gonna be starting on February 1st. Um, but 
again, just honored to be in a group of great knowledgeable people as I am. And as I said, CFN represents a community of fantastic anglers. They're there to help, there to educate and not humiliate. And as you can see on our Facebook page, it is all about Canadian angling and Canadian anglers. So again, Lawrence, for all you do every Monday, you bring so much wealth of knowledge uh, and, and uh, you, you dive deep into all the topics. And again, we, we're, we're so thankful to have you with us and to be a part of this uh, tonight. So thanks again. Well, thanks, Scotty. I appreciate it. And all the work you do, Ben, you work so hard on all this and you've accomplished so much. And, you know, and there is another researcher, not last but not least, you know, these researchers work behind the scenes like Trevor and like Chris, you know, in Saskatchewan, you know, guarding and, and, and making sure that that science is there to make science based, you know, policy decisions around fishing regulations on, you know, how big and small and how many fish should be caught. It, it, without the science, we would have very bad regulations and, uh, and the government can't do it all. So it's really cool that you got private sector here with Angler Atlas working with universities uh, across Canada to collect this data and hand it free charge over to the government. Chris, uh, what, or Yannick, why, into, introduce Chris, please. So our final panelist tonight is Christopher Summers, Summers, sorry, who is an associate professor of biology at the University of Regina, and who is also the Canada Research Chair on Genes and the Environment. All right, well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me on uh, the panel tonight. I'm super excited, and as I, as I warned Lawrence, uh, you give a professor an open mic, and you just might never get the floor back, so I'm going to try uh, to harness my, my energy here. Um, and I want to start with a little bit of a story that is, is a little bit different. Uh, so I, I'm an ecologist. I work with a variety of types of critters and uh, have a large and intensive fisheries research program, but also work on other things. And I wanted to give an example of um, to sort of lead in and, and give you a backdrop for why I think an app based um, approach to, to collecting fish data is important. One of the groups I work on are snakes. And uh, some years ago, this would be 15 years ago in Saskatchewan, a uh, a rancher ran over a snake in his driveway and brought the dead snake into a colleague of mine at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum and said, I've never seen a snake like this before. What is this? And it turned out to be an Eastern yellow belly racer, which is a species that's at risk of extinction in Canada. And this was a single point in the middle of a place where they hadn't been seen for decades. So the question is, are there more of them out there? Where are they? How many of them are there? And how are they doing? Uh, now, Myself and my colleague at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum are two scientists in the vast landscape of Southern Saskatchewan and Alberta, trying to look for a literal needle in a haystack, right? And my thought was, wouldn't it be spectacular if there was a network of citizen scientists who were trained in snake ID, who could look for us and help out with delineating the range of this critter. And fast forward 15 years and here I am working on fish and the network is out there when you work on fish, right? The anglers are out there. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of them putting in the person hours on the water. They are skilled at identifying fish. They are skilled at handling, measuring, weighing, uh, describing fish. And uh, you know that if, if you could harness that and centralize it in a way where the data were accessible, uh, that would be a dream for me, right? And so I think as some of the other panelists have said, that's really what the app-based approach to uh, recording fish data does. And uh, so I study walleye tournaments pretty uh, intensively and used to the standard format of, you know, catch, weigh, release. And there's some really good information I can get from that. And myself, my students spent a lot of time at weigh scales, intercepting a sample of fish and we you know, we're checking on condition, we're checking on size, we're tagging fish and releasing them. And we get a good amount of data that way, but we're really limited in terms of how many fish can you process in that window, you know, when hundreds of fish are coming through the way station. Um, when the app collects the data, you know, the anglers are entering the data and it's getting compiled in a central source, right? So we're not limited by the number of staff or the number of students that can be present uh, or the number of events that can be attended in person by my team. And so I think that's really where some of the big advantages lie. Um, we get different types of data sometimes, you know, like, uh, for example, when I'm at the weigh scale, I don't know exactly where a fish came from that I'm tagging. All I know is it came from within a set of boundaries. 
uh, the app records some location information that may be of interest from uh, a biology and habitat point of view. So uh, I think they're quite complementary to each other and there's a, a, you know, potentially a big market there. Uh, the other thing that I think is uh, fantastic is the possibility for things like biodiversity indices. So we just talked about the number of species that are involved. Um, I work on invasive fish species. So Prussian carp are a huge concern in Western Canada. And, uh, you know, guess where we get most of our information about the distribution of Prussian carp from? It is anglers who catch them by accident when they're fishing for walleye, right? And they say, what the heck is this, right? And they send me a picture of it and I say, oh, that's a Prussian carp, that's not good, right? Uh, so I think there's a lot of, of potential here to move above and beyond, um, you know, sort of basic uh, information on particular sport fish and expanding to a whole variety of, of scientific questions. So, um, so I, I see a ton of potential in it. I myself am involved in two big projects uh, with Sean and his crew. There's the walleye aspect, and then we also do some work on largemouth bass, and uh, we're interested in their distribution relative to some um, habitat features and how that's going to change over time as uh, the environment in a particular reservoir here changes. So lots and lots of potential there. But I think the thing I want to emphasize is just that this technology gives us the ability to centralize and make systematic the observations that hundreds of thousands of anglers and person hours can bring to the table. And uh, I think as it as was said so nicely is that there's just not enough scientists to go around. And uh, I think anglers Actually, I should take that back. I think anglers are scientists, right? They're always pitching their, you know, their knowledge against the behavior and the habitat use of the fish. But um, this is a way to, to um, officially make them scientists and have them contribute data. So I think I'm close to my five minutes there, Lawrence, and I better stop because if I take another breath, you know, we just never know where it might stop. <laughs> Let's slip it into professorship yeah. and a 50 minute lecture. Chris, <laughs> thanks so much for that. Nice summary, nice way to wrap this up, man. And uh, yeah, beautifully done. All of the panelists, just wonderful uh, presentations and, and sorry for the pressure cooker. But uh, you guys flew through this and um, now let's get to the anglers and, and here's some questions from the anglers and uh, Yannick, you've been tracking and we've got some other people working behind the scenes here tracking these live feeds. Uh, do we have some questions for our panelists and pull, pull one out of the hat? Yeah, so I have lots of supportive comments that we've gotten in. Um, so somebody has asked, this is mostly geared towards powerboat anglers, correct? Um, that's a good question. Uh, what do you think, Jeff? I mean, with your experience on the East Coast? Absolutely not. Um, this is, uh, you know, you, have, you can use the app as long as you got a phone and you can catch a fish, you're in. So we had, uh, we actually this year, the, uh, we call it the individual uh, section of our tournament. We have a team tournament too. And many, many of those folks uh, stand on the shores along the Miramichi and provide us excellent information. In fact, I think the young lad, uh, Sean, that was the guy, that, or uh, Trevor, the guy that got the 38 uh, species, I think he never set foot in a boat. I think it was all from shore and, wow. and was able to get 38 species. So definitely, um, you know, open to everybody, which is excellent for Creel data, right? To have a broad-based approach to that. What about you, Scotty? What's your your experience with all the anglers you're dealing with uh, with CFN? Well, I think it's a, a great question. Great question to start with anyway. Uh, one thing that we want to do with the CFN Fish Shop is to show how accessible Canadian angling actually is. And the fact that with the, the my catch this year, uh, hopefully going forward with our spring, uh, which is truly the, the largest multi-species online tournament in Canada, we are going to dispel any um, notions of it being a boater app. Uh, whereas, as I said, at the CFN Fish Shop, we, it's not that we discourage the use of boats, we encourage shore anglers. And we, the idea of CFN is, again, as I said, to, to show the average angler that, you know what, there's, there's some incredible angling opportunities, not too far away from where you live, and you don't need the most expensive boat, uh, the best, you know, fish finder, you know, best gear, what have you. You can go out there with something you can pick up a Canadian tire, relatively uh, inexpensive, and have a great day on a shoreline, uh, a, a river bank, what have you. And uh, the fact that, as I said, we, we get in our online tournament, uh, somewhere upwards of like 12, 1400 submissions. Uh, and I would say most 80% of them are from shore. So, 
Any uh, any notions of the MyCatch not uh, being suited for shore anglers will definitely be uh, answered uh, when we see it in the uh, CFM fish shop this year. And one thing for sure, based on what I'm hearing, is that anglers may buy, you know, they might not spend a lot of money on fishing equipment if they can't afford it, but they'll all spend money on a smartphone. And they all seem to have a smartphone, you know, for taking the pictures and, and tracking their data and communicating and, you know, rescue, all of that. It's just a great, great tool to have. Yannick, we got another question? Yes. So the next question is, has, has the MyCatch app helped in any way in the prevention of the spread of Asian carp? For example, any data collected on this invasive species? Uh, Chris, you, you were mentioning Prussian carp. What, you have some uh, results that you could share with us? Yeah, sure. I can, I can certainly tell you that um, we have learned a lot more about the, the distribution and spread of Prussian carp since anglers have been involved in reporting. Um, unfortunately, that has not resulted in a way to stop them from moving. But uh, in order for that to even be in the realm of possibility, you have to know where they are. And uh, so the observations of, of these fish is the, is the first step. And that's really what we've been able to, to get from them. Um, in terms of the other uh, group of, of four species of carp that used to be collectively called Asian carp, um, I think that their invasion largely comes before the time of, of the MyCatch app. So I'm not sure if there's been any involvement there, but maybe Sean has a, a, a different perspective on that. Before we get to Sean, Trevor, you 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 take a different approach on this. I mean, there's a, a lot of um, a lot of combatancy between different angling communities on the East Coast. You know, the Atlantic salmon purists and and feeling that they're being outdone by some of these non-native fish species that have taken hold in in these waters. But but you're you know you're putting these other fish species on the map, aren't you, Trevor? Talk to us a little bit about that and and how you're how you're coming to the defense of some of these other fish species. Well, it's a, it's an interesting question. As you know, the, the, the anglers are very passionate about their specific uh, species of fish. And sometimes there's just a little, uh, a little bit of understanding and a little bit of knowledge sharing that needs to happen to, to, to demonstrate that there are other species out there and the, and the whole system is in harmony. And when that system gets uh, out of harmony, that's when, that's when people start, you know, uh, the conflicts, I guess, arise. Uh, and, and that's not really anyone's fault, um, but we should probably uh, be in this together as a team and be looking at all these species as a team and know that you're, you're, you're part of that uh, solution as, a, as an angler. If you can collect information that nobody else has, then, then you have vital information that, that should be shared. And, and I think that's where my catch helps is that you can be a, a very passionate angler be moving around and if you're willing to share then there's going to be somebody out there that's that's willing to look at that information and uh that that's where uh uh they kind of the the app approach kind of transcends the community approach which is me going out to the community trying to wrestle up a bunch of anglers get them to help me out with something right you can only get so far with that and uh, the my catch is just going to make that uh, take off I think. In the interest of moving along and getting more questions Sean we'll, we'll get back to you but uh, Yannick got another one for us? Yes we have a few coming in now so the next question is how many people are using this app to document the fish they catch for recreational consumptive purposes? Sean do you keep track of uh, who's catching and releasing and who's who's consuming? Uh, we've kept track of part of it, uh, but we've recently updated, so we're keeping track of all, so we can track whether we're releasing, and right uh, up until, uh, I think it was end of last year, we had uh, options, so if an uh, angler wants to, they can report a release, but it wasn't, uh, there wasn't uh, a choice for them to report kept and harvested, so we've updated that this year, because that's something that's been uh, requested many times, so we're starting to collect the uh, harvest data. Uh, now, but uh, we can only infer it from the, the people that didn't release it previously. Uh, another question, Yannick? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, so the next question is, how does this work in areas with no cell reception? Can it store data internally and then push them to the servers once anglers are back in town? Uh, that's another technical one for you, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, simple answer is yes. Uh, that's how it's designed. Basically, you've got a, a miniature database on your phone. So as you're out, out of range, you're taking pictures, you're recording your catches, it's all saved on your phone. When you get back into range, you can sync it up either through Wi-Fi 
or if you've got lots of data, uh, you can do it through a, a cell tower. So you're not, it's not chewing up your data when you got that app on, even if you're in range. Well, if, if you're syncing uh, uh, through cell, yeah, it'll, it'll chew up your data. So for the people who are very sensitive about the data, uh, uh, don't use your, your cell, use Wi-Fi. Hmm. Okay. This Yannick? Is a, oh, yeah, sorry. Just, just as a side note, we ran into that a lot in the Miramichi. There's quite a remote parts of the river. Yeah. And uh, a lot of anglers had that question. And, um, you know, once we talked them through, it was one of the little one-pagers that Sean and I put together to, for instructions. And it worked really well. In fact, a lot of folks would just leave it off till they got home and sync it with their Wi-Fi once they got home and all the data would go through if they were data conscious. So it worked very well. I think it's brilliant because your GPS antenna too, it, it doesn't depend on cellular connectivity. Your GPS is still working out there with your phone. So that that feature, you know, and, and you, Sean, is that is that data that you're gathering as well on these anglers? Yeah, and the GPS is probably the most sensitive of the topic. So uh, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Lawrence. Um, this is something we take very seriously. And, and every time I speak with a local fishing club or tournament anglers, that's generally one of the first things we talk about is the, the data privacy. So we want to collect data so that the researchers like you see around uh, the table here uh, can have access and really understand things. What we want to do is make sure we protect the privacy of our anglers, the privacy of the locations as well. And the privacy is for two reasons. First is certainly people spend a lot of time and effort getting to know their secret spots. And you'll get into serious trouble if you start re revealing those secret spots. But it's also for conservation. I mean, it doesn't take long to fish out a, a beautiful bull trout stream here in BC uh, with that exact location. So what what the rule is, is secret spots stay secret. And, and when we're working with, um, with, whether it be Trevor or Chris or any of the other researchers, uh, we have a data sharing agreement that we have with them. And we want them to use this data and publish it, but they can't release secret spots. And so the idea is you can generalize it to a large area. So for example, the Striper Cup on the Miramichi, we can talk about the data we collect on the Miramichi. And the key mm -hmm. is making sure you can't reverse engineer back to a location. And that's the real test when we're thinking uh, what we what we want to put out there versus what we want to keep private. And that works for tournaments as well. Um, Jeff, in terms of you're, you're comfortable that these fish are being caught in the, in the tournament zone, they're being uh, that where the tournament's supposed to be taking place. Well, yep. Uh, Sean's app is able to define boundaries. So we were able to put the boundaries of the waterways in place and they could tell if they were, you know, caught within those boundaries and those sorts of things. And, and certainly um, his panel, uh, his judges, the, the folks, the biologists that were looking at these fish, they did a super fantastic job. Like it was, it was incredible when we had 12,500 fish submitted through an app and uh, we had one month and they, they would pick out somebody trying to put the same fish in. Like it was incredible. Um, it just, uh, it, it, and you know, the anglers really, we, I got, we got so much support from the anglers. They came on board big time and, 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 you know, some guys, I think uh, someone had like almost a kilometer of fish, like one fella, I think it was like 4,000, like it was an incredible amount of fish himself. Like, so, so we had prizes for the person with the most fish, the prize for the smallest fish, the prize for the biggest fish. And, you know, it, uh, it really, we, I mean, it, it was, it was well done. And, um, you know, Secret spots stay in secret. I couldn't even get one spot out of Sean. Like I'm like, yeah, where did the biggest one come from? Sam Andrews was the researcher. His, his uh, girlfriend got the biggest one. Luckily, I was on the water, so I kind of saw where it was. But there was no way. Like you just can't get the information. And I'm a pretty competitive guy. Um, we have some fish finders and stuff from Garmin where you share uh, contour maps. And when I first yeah. got it, I had it on share and people could tell where I was. I had to shut it off, <laughs> <laughs> but now it's okay. We got enough people out there, but yeah, uh, no, it's good. Yeah. And Chris, for you, I mean, you're tracking these Prussian carp. Is it going to give you the details you need to know where these Prussian carp are being identified or do people have to manually, you know, load that information in, or is there a way of getting to that data? Yeah, so the for me the uh, you know that I think that the agreement that we have with Sean for data sharing is that we don't disclose exact coordinates, right? But general areas are okay. Yeah, so okay. Uh, we can do things, and this is common uh, in biology when you're dealing with sensitive species. So I also work with sharp-tailed grouse, which you know form leks, and uh, we don't want people to know exactly where those leks are. And we have snakes that are in hibernacula, 
we don't want people to know exactly where they're grouping up. Uh, and we use, there's tricks that we use to, to disguise that when the data sets have to be made um, accessible with a publication, for example. And uh, most recently, some sharp tail grouse work we did, we, uh, you know, we get the exact coordinates, but we offset it when we, when we publish the data by a random distance, right? Mm -hmm. So that people never know exactly where the, the lack is located. And uh, so when we go to publish stuff and, and, you know, we'll work with Anglers Atlas on this, you know, we can, we can see as long as we don't disclose the exact locations when we're doing our data analysis and that sort of thing. And when we go to publish, uh, we'll work with Sean to make sure that, you know, whatever we do is acceptable in terms of not being able to do that reconstruction of the specific site. So that was a long-winded way of saying, I get to see where the exact site was. I just don't get to publish it uh, and spread it around. But I think the important message here is that there's different purposes for different types of GPS coordination on, on this, these catches. And, and, and it's always serving a purpose that's a good purpose and no one's using it for, for bad uh, reasons. So that's, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yannick, uh, where we got to next year? Yeah. So the next question says, do you folks think the growth in anglers and angling has, that has come as a result of the pandemic will continue once restrictions and the like are removed and things normalize somewhat? Scotty, kicking this one over to you. Well, I, I will definitely say one of the, the bright spots of the pandemic, and I say that, uh, you know, uh, very reservedly because, you know, unfor unfortunately, some people's worlds have been flipped upside down from this pandemic. And to those, you know, uh, we, we think of you, we have you in our thoughts, those of you've lost family members, this, that, and everything else. Uh, so it's hard for me to talk about something that's exciting when it comes to the pandemic. But one thing that I can honestly say is angling has grown. Uh, we see this with our sponsors, Shimano uh, specifically. Uh, they have seen a growth in sales like they've never seen before. And the only thing they can attribute it to is, of course, the fact that folks don't really have a lot to do. One thing that was never really restricted was angling. Uh, yes, travel has been, uh, but uh, angling, they, they've never deterred you from going out and wetting a line. And because of that, uh, you've seen a huge spike in, um, you know, license purchase, uh, a huge spike in in gear and, and anything. I mean, you go out and try and find a boat right now. I understand the supply chain has a lot to do with that, but the fact that people are buying them left, right, and center, ATVs, I mean, you can't buy stuff like this uh, if you go into a store. Just It's not available because people are gobbling all this stuff up, but uh, absolutely, uh, I would have to say that uh, the one bright spot about this pandemic is the fact that angling uh, has increased. The passion for angling has uh, broadened and uh, we, we hope at CFN to capture that and, and work with that and build on that. Um, and uh, yes, absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more anglers uh, posting pics. Uh, as I said, we have editors that do all kinds of great editing. Well, Walter and Steve are busy, uh, probably as I speak, putting edits together right now that we post. And uh, we've seen uh, uh, an uptick in, in edits alone. So yes, uh, I, can, I can definitely see that the pandemic has had a direct result of that. Sean, Sean, has your uh, engineers responded to all these new anglers that are looking for information on how to fish, where to fish, you know, what to use? Uh, it, it just see the uh, the MyCatch app playing a role in sort of re retaining these all these new anglers, so they don't leave frustrated, leave the sport frustrated, but they can they can network and and gain knowledge and 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 be mentored through this app into becoming you know um, anglers that are that are somewhat successful and happy with the sport. Yeah, so it's always a delicate balance, uh, what to share and what to make sure you don't share. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we've done with Anglers Atlas is provide a lot of basic information like detailed bathymetric maps, fish stocking data, other publicly available information. And we do include some of that uh, in the app. You can actually, when you're, you can search for water bodies and you can pull that. Uh, we still don't rely heavily on the website. That seems to be where most of the angler traffic is. And primarily because we've done a good job with Google search. So you type in an obscure lake name and you will come up in the search engine. And that's how a lot of anglers find us. Uh, and, and and Trevor, um, you know, we have, you know, Atlantic salmon angling has been a mainstay of Atlantic Canada for like 150 years for, for settlers and, and foreigners coming to this country to just experience that fishing, to see this app as, uh, as broadening the horizon, you know, for, for these types of anglers, uh, introducing them to other species. Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, when we re when we started the uh, Atlantic Anglers Challenge, it was uh, one of the things that we did to try to get people. Well, first of all, it was a COVID friendly 
tournament so people could go out. So I echo what Scotty was saying, you know, an increase in, in people going out and fishing. Um, and we didn't get a, a ton of anglers on that first uh, tournament, but there were quite a few, over 100. Uh, produced all kinds of interesting data, over 5,000 data points from 46 species. I think I said 30 some before, but 46 species total. Um, and and it, I think it's changed people's minds about the other fish that are out there. Because mm. when you put a challenge on, you say, hey, you could win 500 bucks if you catch the longest chain pick girl. And they're like, I don't fish those things. And they're like, but for 500 bucks, I might try it. <laughs> and and uh, they go out and they catch chain pick girl. Next thing you know, they're hooked on a new fishery. And and this is the so I monitor all uh, all the uh, local community uh, uh, Facebook pages, um, and you just see upticks in people saying, "Hey, I never fished these things before. I got into it because of some tournament or because I heard that about this through through uh, uh, my catch or something like that." And uh, next thing, they're fishing that species, and I, it's great because it diversifies the angling and it takes the pressure off some of the species that might need a little bit of pressure taken off, like Atlantic mm -hmm. salmon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Yannick, another question. Yes. So someone has asked, is there an option for the user of the app to download their own catch data? Say on an annual basis, for example, does it store individual angler data? Yeah, Yannick, how do you, uh, um, sorry, but Sean, how do you integrate that with the, the uh, maps? Because that's how Angler Atlas started, right? It was all maps and then the, the app came later. So there must be a connection. Yeah, and that was the original idea of the app is that it's a personal catch log where all your catches get consolidated. And if you go to your profile view, I know when I pull up my app, uh, I just got back from a, a sturgeon trip on the Fraser. So all my sturgeon catches are there stored, but I can also reference back to the fishing at Cunningham Lake where we caught uh, 20 rainbow trouts or the, the trip we took on the West Coast. So it's all basically integrated as a personal catch log. We thought originally that would be the real draw to anglers, but the tournaments are really where we're seeing a lot of the uptake because I guess, well, when you put some money on the line, uh, that makes it serious. But yeah, that's already integrated in that. But I guess the one thing I'd probably add in on that is we haven't actually got a system where you can download that data, but I think that's a great idea so that if an angler wants to download all their personal data into a spreadsheet or something, it's really fairly easy for us to do. We just haven't uh, implemented it, but uh, I'll bring that up with our developers next time. And it's something that maybe you don't do through the app, but you log into the website because you use the same account and maybe you just download it from your profile page. But yeah, that's a good suggestion. But you will see it on your own maps, on your own phone. Totally. You're, oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So that your, your, your very special spots are just there to remind you where you caught that face so you can go back there. That's Bingo. cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Yannick, another question? Yes. So the next question is, would my catch be open to allowing their app to be adapted for other species, crowdsourcing citizen science can make a huge difference. The River Institute as a partner, question mark. I did not ask this. <laughs> it's okay, Yannick, Sean, it's, uh, it's you again, man. It's, uh, are you, you, you're doing partnerships all around the place, but, but do you oh, change yeah. the skin on these? Like, do you give it different names or is it always my catch? Well, when you're saying other species, you mean other fish species, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, well, well, I think we've got currently 200 and some odd species and we can add a species in minutes. Uh, if we've got a species request, we can add it in just to the database and then it'll automatically appear. I mean, the question is how many species do we wanna go? I mean, there's what, 30,000 saltwater species. Uh, we added all the rockfish species for a project we're working with on the West Coast. Uh, I think there's 37 different rockfish species. So we've added those in. And if there's a species that an angler is interested in that's not currently on the list, uh, send us an email. We can we can get that added. Yeah, because you know things happen, right? You know, there's the flood, and all of a sudden everyone's worried about you know what happened to the salmon in the uh, Fraser River with the flood. So everyone wants to track if there's salmon still around, or or there's a you know a, a frost or something happens. So yeah, to be able to pop in a species and and concentrate some citizen science in, in a certain area to to assess damage, it's 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 brilliant. Well, yeah, see, that, I'll just uh, give, yeah. give you a uh, pick up on that. That was the reason we were down on the Fraser with the Sturgeon Society, the Fraser River Sturgeon Society, is after the Fraser is blown out, you know, it's carved new channels, deposited, spawning beds are gone. What's the impact? And so we're uh, wanting mm. to demonstrate that anglers can get out there rapidly uh, and do simple comparisons. Uh, they've got a 20-year data set of angler data uh, on the Fraser for sturgeon. 
let's see catch rates. Are they going up or down? Are the lengths going up or down? Are the locations changing? And we'll be able to get that data instantly. And our hope is if we can get it all together. Uh, we'll be presenting uh, preliminary results at the Canadian Conference for Fisheries Research at the end of February. And the really Ill point here to illustrate is how rapid we can do this stuff. Uh, because it's all digital, and then you can quickly visualize it through dashboards. So data anyway, just, sorry to... the data just keeps pouring in, doesn't it? Yeah, a big wave. That's so cool. And you know what? We could have used that on the St. Lawrence with those uh, two floods uh, in the last uh, six years. Uh, you know, man, that really changed the whole nature of the St. Lawrence River. Yannick, you got another question for us? Yes. So there's another one here. White elephant in the room. Is there ever a cost to the user of the MyCatch app? Oh, yeah, well, Jeff, are you uh, are you building in any uh, sort of cost structures, any sort of uh, hidden ways to get some generate some capital for the tournament? Uh, not no, strictly an expense for us. We pay Sean to uh, provide the service, uh, who um, which is awesome. Uh, it's well worth it, considering we used to have students and people would email us pictures and we would look at the measuring tape with our you know it just uh, we've gone really high tech. Um, as far as, you know, I always ask Sean, how are you going to monetize this uh, just to cover expenses, really? Like it's, it's, I, one thing that I've always, I was really, really impressed with Sean is it's never been about like big money to him. It's always been about the science, science and the data and the fishery. And, and so every chance I got to speak to corporate sponsors and, and, and get them to uh, step up as as corporate fishing you know people to put prizes it's, it seems to come quite easy because they know it's going for a good thing so I, you know i think sean maybe you should comment on how your mom yeah go, i go guess ahead, sean yeah for for every tournament uh most of them there's a entry registration fee so there's always that element of the cost uh, so people participate and we get generally about, uh, uh, we like to target between 80 to 90% payout. So, uh, you know, you put a hundred bucks in 80, 90%, we want to go back to the payout. So there's a portion of that that comes back to us, although Shopify then also takes a ding of that. In terms of uh, just uh, personal use of the app, that's never been uh, part of the plan. I mean, from a revenue perspective, most of our money is generated when we're out selling to sponsors, you know, like we're hoping to bring on some big sponsors for our Walleye Wars series, uh, getting the sponsors to contribute some funding that way. We've got an email list of about 125,000 anglers across Canada. We we use that and, and we will basically uh, do email campaigns for partners heavily in the tourism sector. And we do do research partnerships like the Rockfish Project we mentioned. That's in partnership with University of Victoria, Ball State University, DFO. And that's a research grant that we get a chunk of. So those are the three core revenue streams. Really, the most important thing uh, from the anglers is we need the, the data. So I don't see charging anglers for anything particular. I haven't, or at least I, I can't see how that model works. The most important thing for us is to get the angler data. So we've got to make this as easy as effortless and and accessible to as many anglers as possible. So I hope that answers the question on the revenue side. What about you, Scotty? You know, all your tournaments are based on a, a whole bunch of great sponsors who want their products to be recognized, at least acknowledged, to, to see their a need to give those sponsors some recognition on an app like this. 100%. And, and as I've said to all of our anglers and participants of the CFN Fish Off, as long as I'm on this earth, uh, the CFN Fish Off will always be free to any of our participants. We will never be charging uh, any of our anglers to participate. And, and why would we? Because it's about promoting how accessible angling is. And the minute you put a dollar figure, um, it, it, it wavers. And as I said, with, with a gentleman like Jeff, who is doing tournaments on a very large scale. I, I certainly understand the need for an entrance fee, uh, but for us, you know, shoreline anglers and trying to promote that, that grassroots angling, um, as I said, it's not something that we will ever do to, uh, to, to our fish office to monetize. And mm -hmm. Sean, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, in, in regards to data, and I know you want as much data as possible. Is there any way an angler can find out if a body of water has not received any data are you going to be sponsoring or, or promoting certain bodies of water that boy we, we'd really like to get some data on this lake we haven't had a single catch entered uh, how can I go about being a part of uh, you know a data stream for that body of water yeah we haven't gone down that uh, granular level yet but uh, and again this is this gets a little sensitive because on the really small bodies of water 
it's like you're giving away a location. So we're kind mm -hmm. of sensitive about those, but Nipissing, let's say. I mean, it's not like you're giving away a, a location. So if we're going after that, in some cases we have. So for example, when we first launched it, we wanted to get a lot of river data in, in Alberta to do our scientific analysis with traditional creel surveys. So we would actively promote without biasing the creel because you don't want to have a whole bunch of anglers descend on a water body and totally skew the data. So we'd say uh, we'd put some prizes out there for the river, uh, uh, more river data in a specific part of the, the province or a specific region. And that's the way we sort of pull, but we haven't really focused heavily on specific water bodies, except at the tournament level where you're heavily focused on that, that one water body mm. or that selection of water bodies. And I guess I'd, I'd, I'll add one thing in terms of the, the cost for the, the, the tournaments. Yeah, we run a number of tournaments that are free, like our Iowa one, one that we got going. So there's no registration fee on that one. But uh, our higher end tournaments, like certainly our walleye wars, where there's really big payouts of a $10,000 first prize, yeah, um, you're going to put 250 bucks in uh, to to get that big prize. And uh, I guess one more thing uh, on that in terms of uh, something we brought up earlier, which was shore fishing. The biggest prize for the, I think the last two walleye wars, fall brawl, were won from shore. And those nice. are monster walleyes. So. Well, there you go. Hey, you know what, you guys? Eight o'clock, an hour has flown by. We've got more questions. Um, Yannick can email the questions and maybe we can put a, get some responses and uh, publish that, eh, Yannick? What do you think? Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. So yeah, let's not leave, leave these questions unanswered. Let's, let's, let's put, put them all out there and, and, um, and, and we'll send them out to you guys. And if you want to pick a question here or there and just give a quick response, we'll, we'll, we'll put that on the uh, River Institute website with the notes for, uh, to the link to this uh, episode. Th hey, thanks everyone, man. This has been really cool. Um, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, Sean and I were talking about doing this. You know, I've talked to all of you guys about apps over the years. Yeah, Yannick came and approached me and said, Lawrence, we'd like you to do something about uh, apps on uh, our Wednesday night um, science uh, talk. And I said, well, it just so happens. Let's get, us, get everyone together. And here we are. So thanks, everyone. And um, Yannick, you want to close us up then? And uh, we'll be out of here. Yeah, so thanks to all the panelists for joining us tonight and big thank you to Lawrence Gunther for hosting and thank you to everyone for watching um, the three different channels are quite active with questions so thanks for all the questions and for a fantastic conversation. Um, we will be answering any questions that were left unanswered um, if we can, and we will do it on the, the, the networks that the questions were asked under. So I hope everyone has a good evening and we'll see you for the next workshop which we host. Thanks. Yeah. Check in as the St. Lawrence River Institute has one almost every Wednesday or every second Wednesday. They've got some great speakers and um, I can't come down there and have the Wiener schnitzel and the, and the beer, but I do it virtually. So, <laughs> well, no beer, no Wiener schnitzel, but the content is excellent. Thanks, everyone. Bye.